All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Covenant City Church. It's a joy to be able to worship with you again today, um, a day that I look forward to, and I hope you do as well, uh, because there's something about public worship that does things in our hearts that private worship cannot, and I think that's a big reason of why the Lord commands us to come together uh, in one voice and worship him as a people on this Lord's day. Uh, my name is Tazar, one of the elders at Covenant City Church, if this is your first time here. And at CCC, we do want to uh, invite everyone to participate in the act of worship, meaning if you have your liturgies with you, there are going to be times when we're going to ask you to sit up and stand, uh, uh, stand up and sit down and uh, read out loud passages. You'll have the cue there on the, on the liturgy that you're going to read out loud together, Bible verses, pray together so that we can all join together in one voice and worship our Lord and our God. Okay, uh, before that, let me pray for us. And then after I pray, I'm gonna invite us to read our call to worship today, taken from Romans chapter eight, verses one to four, as we continue in our time of worship. So if you would, at this time, uh, bow your heads and join me in prayer as we enter into uh, a time of, of worship. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that today as we come and worship you, the first and most important thing that would happen is that you would be glorified and that you'd be pleased uh, by the worship of our mouth as it expresses the love of our heart, the love that we so often forget throughout the week. And we come here today, Father, not based upon our own pure record, not based upon our own righteous moral deeds. We come here only because you have given your son to take the punishment that we deserve live the life we should have lived, and give us the righteousness that we could never earn on our own. Jesus Christ, who became our lamb, who became our righteousness. Through him and him alone, Father, do we boldly come to you today before your throne, not only to worship and praise you, but also to hopefully experience um, a growth in our likeness of your son, in our love for you. And I pray, Father, as we uh, all come here today, all those things would happen. And may the gospel shine forth great, not only through what we preach and sing, but also through every part of our liturgy today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I invite us to stand and let's read out loud together our, our call to worship today, taken from Romans chapter eight, verses one to four. If you would, join me in one voice as we read it out loud. Romans chapter eight, verse one to four. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings around me, rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father.
father's world. This is my father's world. Though soiled by our sin, creation groans for God alone can liberate us from within. This is my Father's world, and so He's and His Son, by grace through faith our lives to save, and sanctify us till He's done. This is my Father's world, and all will be made new. Our darkest days will pass away, and He will make His dwelling place. Our darkest days will pass away, and He will make His dwelling place. All right, so the next song is a new song that we're going to learn together. But it reminds us that in the midst of all life's complexities, that He remains our strength, peace, hope, and joy, and that He is all we need. The bridge of this song is actually a famous children's song, so if you're a parent, do encourage your kids to participate, for they're part of this church as much as the rest of us are. So let's try to sing this song together. strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do 
Amen. Friends, uh, let's not forget that how we as adults also often need to be reminded of those truths, not only our children. All right, as we enter into our time of confession of sin, uh, I do want to point out something a bit strange or off maybe from our call to worship passage, if you want to take a look at it again. Because we all know, friends, that the law of God is a good thing. Right, like the Ten Commandments, uh, all of his other moral laws that he's commanded in the Bible, those are those are obviously good things. So why then, if you take a look at verse two in our call to worship today, Paul there seems to describe the law as a negative thing. Look at verse two. Paul describes the law as the law of what? The law of sin and death. Well, that's weird, isn't it? Shouldn't it be the law of righteousness and life? Why, why did he say sin and death? Well, friends, what Paul meant there is not that the law in within itself produces sin and death, but it does reveal sin and death. Verse 3 says the law shows us just how sinful and weak we actually are. Uh, one day, a life ago, during my tennis years, I uh, ignored an injured ankle and I hid it from my coach because I really wanted to play this match on the next day. But my coach, knowing that I was hiding an injury, he gave me a command. He said, okay, Tez, uh, go run around these four courts, and then after that, we'll practice for tomorrow's match. Sure enough, I started running. Uh, court one, I started strong. Court two, I slowed down a bit. Court three, I started limping. And then right around the corner of court four, I I was walking. I couldn't run at all. Now, my coach knew all along that I couldn't do it. He knew I was injured. So then why did he command me to do it in the first place? Because I didn't know that I couldn't do it. You see? It's one thing to tell someone you need help. It's another thing to show them that they need help. Go ahead. God commands us. Go ahead. Don't envy your neighbor. Do it. Can you trust me enough to be 100% content with the lot in life that I've given you and not compare it with what I've given other people? Do it. Also, don't hate others in your heart. Go ahead, do it. Also, forgive your enemies, he said. Not just your friends, but your enemies. 70 times 7. Go ahead and do it. And we've tried, haven't we? But we can't do it. Most of us don't even make it past court number one. 
I surely don't. So friends, with that in mind, I want to invite us to read out loud our confession of sin today, taken from Romans chapter 3, verse 20, of how God's good and righteous law proves just how sinful and weak we actually are. Okay, so let's read out loud our confession of sin today, taken from Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and we have before us a set of good and righteous laws, and we've tried to do it, though we barely could even pass court one. We fail, we limp, we fall. In fact, we couldn't do it altogether. Hear us now, Father, as we confess to you just how far our life is from the righteous requirements of your holy law. The sins that we've committed this week or this month, perhaps. Hear now, Father, our silent prayers of confession. Father, we come to you and you know all of these things uh, better than we do. You've already known from the beginning how much we fall short from your law. But hear now, Father, our um, cry of our hearts and remind us as we do so the assurance of pardon that we have in Christ alone. In Jesus' name and in his name alone we pray. Amen. Friends, the reason why we often forget how desperate we are for salvation, the reason why we forget how desperate we are for Christ is because we don't pay enough attention to the law. We ignore it. We brush it under the rug. We pretend like it's not that high. But if you, play, if you pay close attention to the law, what you'll quickly see is that we are all filled not with righteousness in life, but with sin and death. So then what does God do? Once the law shows just how weak and unable we are to fulfill it, what does God do? Does he just ignore the death and the sin in our life that the law reveals? No. Let me read to you our assurance of pardon today, taken from Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 27. This is what God did. This is, by the way, right after Romans chapter 3, verse 20, right after our confession of sin. This is what Paul says. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a perpetuation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Listen, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. God knew we couldn't do it. We thought we could. So he told us to do it. And we couldn't. To show us, not just tell us, but to show us how much we need Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we often deny, we even came here today perhaps under the guise that we deserve a seat in your house. None of us do, none of us do. We deserve seats farthest from your throne because of our sin. Your law has proven that but now a righteousness that comes apart from the law, fulfilled by Christ who came and lived the life we should have lived, yet died the death we deserve. Through faith and rest in him and trust in what he's done, we can now be righteous and come to you boldly today in worship because of the lamb who was slain. Let us now continue in our time of praise and worship, knowing that Christ has fully made us worthy to sing these words in Jesus' name and in his name alone we pray, amen. Friends, why don't we stand to our feet and continue on with our worship service.
His perfect love and comfort in your tears. Rest here in His wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it be. Our confession of faith today comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 8, Section 2. Please read out loud with me. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is truly the eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father. In the fullness of time, he took on himself the nature of man with all the essential qualities and ordinary frailties of man, except that he was sinless. Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary out of her substance. These two complete, perfect, and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in the one person of Jesus without being altered, disunited, or jumbled. The person, Jesus, is truly God and truly man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. 
Amen. Thanks, uh, Deborah, for leading us in our Statement of Faith reading today. Friends, if you're new to CCC and are wondering why we do these Statement of, of Faith readings, that's not Bible verses themselves because these are good and helpful summaries of what the Bible teaches. And we try to match our reading with the sermon passage that we're preaching right now. And since through the book of Luke, we're talking a lot about Jesus' humanity and how he was truly human, not only God, but truly human, uh, and lived the perfect life for us, we wanted to match that confession with the passage as well. So please read and study these. Uh, as you guys grow in your own edification as well in the Lord. Okay, so friends, now as we move on in our time of worship and our tithes and offering, I uh, do want to remind you guys that if you're not a member at CCC, don't feel pressured uh, to give to Covenant City Church, but we do want to continually encourage you to give, give graciously to your local churches, wherever it is that you may be a member in, so that you can help them in their mission and work of preaching the gospel, making disciples in the city that we love. But if you are a member at Covenant City Church, then it is a duty and delight of the members of a local church to continue to give for the sustenance of the church that they're a member in. And if you'd like to give to us, that you can do so by the offering bag that will be passed around and also by the QR code that you can find behind your liturgy printouts and also on the screen that's behind me, okay? Let me pray for us as we continue in our time of worship and give back to God what is rightfully his. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today uh, in a time of the service that could seem not as quote-unquote worshipful, but it really is. Uh, acknowledging to our hearts and to the world as we give uh, to you that money is not our God and that money is not the one that can fix all of our problems and is not the object of our worship, but you are. Help us know, Father, uh, not only the members of this church, but also this church as a whole and the leaders of it uh, to both uh, not only give, but also entrust what you have given to us, not as an end goal in itself, but merely as a means to then worship you and continually do your work in the city that we love so that your name and your glory and your gospel may be loud and clear as we preach it and live it and sacrificially give uh, toward it as we uh, continue to represent Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Friends, let's pray one more time. Father, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. I beg you that those words we sung, though not fully yet crystallized in our hearts, and of course we live oftentimes for these things, that you would continually make the cry of our heart, not only here as uh, members of this church or people that are here today, but also as this church, as an institution, that you would protect us from vanity, that you protect us from uh, self-glory, that you protect us from inverting into ourselves, um, worshiping the gifts rather than the gift giver. And may whatever it is you entrust to us, whether money or a people or uh, anything else, talents, would be used for the furthering of your kingdom. Remind us every single day, every single Lord's day of how empty it is and how foolish it is to live for our own little kingdoms, but how worthy and glorious it is to live for yours. You often are not the heart of my heart. I often seek other things. Please be with us, Father, and continue to uh, uh, be with the church in a way that our, the weakness of our flesh, as we just read in our call to worship, uh, cannot accomplish. Thank you, Father, that you are a God who is more committed to this church uh, than anyone here, that you love it more than anyone here. And we rely in you and in you alone uh, for the sustenance and the purity of uh, the, your church. I pray that the gospel will go forth, um, not only by the words that we preach, but also by how we handle and use the things you've entrusted to us so that the world may see that these aren't just empty words, but actual lives, um, actual uh, truths that, have, that truly are meaningful to us. And I pray this also, Father, for other churches in the city, uh, that you would continue to grow all of us and sanctify us, though through pain and fire and hard circumstances, uh, sanctify nonetheless that we would all be more like your son and actually bless the city instead of use the city for our own benefit. Help us do so, Father, and I pray also for uh, all the leaders of the city as well, that you continue to use them to govern uh, in justice and uh, that you would allow them to actually continue to fulfill the vows uh, they, they have vowed to do as they lead the city um, for its flourishing. Thank you, Father, for the men and women here. 
uh, be with us and continue to grow us in your likeness as we continue in this time of worship today, as we end this intercessory prayer in the way that you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, welcome again to Covenant City Church. A few announcements before I dismiss the kids. Uh, the first one is I want to remind you guys again of the men's barbecue event that we got going on. Uh, Saturday, June 8th, when? Uh, at 4 to 8 p.m. It's a long cookout. I'm sure it'll be good. Uh, the venue will be Verde 2 Apartment, okay? And if you want to be part of that, June 8th, 4 to 8 p.m. at Verde 2, register uh, by the link on the screen, the QR code there. Or also, you can go to Church Center, uh, download the Church Center app. If you already have it, just go to it, and uh, you can find the men's barbecue event there and register then. Second announcement, uh, this is an exciting one. Uh, we have, and we've announced uh, a Gloria as a new women's ministry director at our church last Sunday because she happened to do the announcement, but there's two other staff members that we hired and, and uh, we haven't announced yesterday because it just didn't uh, go with the flow of the service, but today we wanted to be intentional and make sure to announce that we have um, uh, hired uh, Anthony for our part-time uh, music ministry director and also Agnes to help out with the staff. So let's welcome them. So if, uh, if, if uh, the music is good, uh, thank us. If it's bad, then talk to Anthony. <laughs> and, uh, and also Agnes will be helping out. Uh, for you that know her, she'll be helping, helping out Grace with all the communications that you guys receive from emails and all that. So please welcome them uh, as they continue to serve the Lord in, a, in, in, this, in this capacity. Third announcement is that we want to remind you guys and we'll continue reminding you until the day of is that we will have uh, Samuel Simanjuntak's floor examination. Uh, Sam, who's been, you, you've seen up here leading liturgy and preaching, uh, he's going to be ordained as a, as a pastor here at Covenant City Church. And the process is that he has to go through a floor exam. A floor, a floor exam means it just he's going to uh, sit up here and then Mike, Elias, and myself, who are the current elders of Covenant City Church, uh, have the freedom to ask him. Any questions about the Bible, about life, about uh, ministry philosophy, uh, and, and uh, he's going to answer and dialogue with us through it just to ensure that the qualification of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 of what an elder needs to be is fulfilled not only uh, individually but also uh, in front of the whole church when it comes to teaching elders and pastors, okay? And you're welcome to come to that. If you want to come to that on June 9th, it'll be like a members meeting, but uh, I think this is open for, for really anyone who wants to come. Uh, June 9th, register on Church Center. Uh, it's going to be, so you can have, we're going to have lunch after the service. And then on, uh, at 12.45 to 1.35, we're going we're gonna to have the lunch and then come in. And Sam will do the floor examination from 12.45 to 1.35, sorry. Lunch will be after service from 12 onwards, okay? Registration deadline by June 4th. Again, at the Church Center app, if you want to open it up, register for lunch there. You'll get lunch, and please join us. I think you guys will be edified as well um, as you hear some of the questions that Sam answers for your own understanding of Scripture and who God is as he's revealed himself to us in the Scriptures. Uh, uh, but also, members, we do need at least 10% of members present for it to count as a proper vote. Uh, so we at least need 52 people, okay? I'm sure 52 of you will come but I'm also hoping that 52 of you will come, okay? At least so, please register and come so it will be an actual uh, a, a voting that counts toward his, Sam's ordination. Third announcement, welcome lunch today. If you wanna join welcome lunch, uh, please register or if you wanna know the details about when and where to the welcome booth as you go out to the elevators there. And then as I dismiss the kids, uh, nursery, a reminder for the nursery parents, for kids ages 18 months and above in the nursery, we do wanna ask you to not, uh, to refrain from eating uh, during the story time. Aside from that, you can eat, but just during that, that short story time, uh, kids ages 18 above in the nursery, if you could refrain from eating uh, so that you can, uh, we can focus on the actual story, um, we, would, we would really appreciate that. And also today, we have upper junior class who will be dismissed to the door on my right, 
but if you are in any other children's ministry class, uh, please uh, go to the door on my left and the uh, volunteer will take your child to the appropriate age group. Okay, so if you're a parent and you want to dismiss your kids, do so now. And everyone else who's still here, if you would rise and uh, uh, for a good minute, greet each other in the name of the Lord. All right, friends, happy Sunday. Uh, before we start our sermon, I just want to correct something that Tezar said. Anthony isn't actually going to be the music ministry director only. He is actually going to be the Sunday operations director. So not only if the music goes wrong, you talk to Anthony, if anything goes wrong at all, Anthony is the guy you go through, right? No pressure, Anthony, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, with that in mind, let us... Go straight into the preaching of God's word. Pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are the works of your hands. And every day you shape us through our experiences, through the mercies you renew every morning, but primarily and most importantly, you shape us through your word. So I pray, Lord, as we discover the story of your son, as he grows and matures into the Lord, the King of heaven and earth, that we may understand, Father, how it is that you shape us. May your words resonate deeply in our hearts, and may your Holy Spirit tune out whatever it is that comes out of my mouth that is not according to your will and purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So friends, today we're going to be continuing our series on Luke's gospel. And the text that we'll be studying today is this pretty interesting little section on Jesus' life. Not as a baby. Nor as an adult. But in between, right? As an adolescent child. It's the only story that we have from this part of Jesus' life we have in the Bible and only present here in the Gospel of Luke. Now, just spoiler alert, right? The key thing that Luke is trying to highlight by including this incident is the humanity of Christ. How even Jesus himself was once a child and that he needed to grow up. Right, look at uh, verse 40 and 52 if you open your Bibles on your devices, right? Both of them talk about how Jesus grew in his favor with God and man. Meaning that Jesus went through a process. But we're never actually told directly how exactly this happened. But are only given this curious story of parental negligence, right? About how he, who was accidentally abandoned by his parents in Jerusalem... Then being found in the temple three days later, totally at home at his father's house. Now, 
for most of us, I understand, especially for those of us growing up Christians, right, this concept of God as Father is probably nothing new. From very early on, we are taught to think of God and address Him primarily as our Heavenly Father, right? That's how we begin most of our prayers. But we must realize that this was not actually the case for Jesus' context. Although there are some places, a handful of places in the Old Testament where God is compared to a father, but there is not one single instance when an individual ever dared to address God personally as my father. Now that's astonishing, even, isn't it, right? That prior to Jesus, not even people who had profound personal encounters with God, not Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, or David, none of them felt like that they had the relational capital with God to be able to call God Father as all of us Christians are invited freely to do. So by including this story, right, I think Luke introduces this new and revolutionary way that humans can relate to God. Relationship that Jesus had through giving us this glimpse of how this father-son relationship plays out in the life of Christ, who was still, remember, at that point in the process of growth. An ongoing process that each of us here today who considers ourselves a child of God are still currently going through. Okay, so let's read it uh, and see what it can teach us. From Luke chapter 2, verse 30, 41 to 52. This is the word of God. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, uh, they went up according to custom. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. And his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Brothers and sisters, this morning I want to point out three things from this text that we can learn about Jesus' growth, um, about Jesus, that we can uh, apply to our growth as children of God. Three things that hopefully will be helpful to us as we remain grounded in this identity the further along we get in our Christian journey, okay? So our three points, spiritual growth, one, ceases when we get complacent about Christ, two, goes forward as we study the word, and three, uh, relativizes every relationship. Ceases when we get complacent with Christ, goes forward as we study the word, relativizes every relationship, okay? May the Lord give us ears to hear his instructions today. So point one. Spiritual growth ceases when we get complacent about Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the first question I was asking when I read this text was, how did Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, let this happen? How did they lose their child? Now, if you understand the context historically, what was going on, it's actually not hard to lose someone in that situation, right? Right? They were in Jerusalem during Passover, and every Jew was supposed to go to the temple to perform their religious duties back then. So scholars estimate that the population of Jerusalem ballooned up to 10%, uh, 10 times its normal size 
during that time. So it was super crowded and people were moving around. Very easy to lose someone. But even so, it seems like Mary and Joseph had some reason to feel like the situation was under control, right? Because uh, verse 41 clarifies that they went on this journey every year, presumably bringing Jesus along with them all these times. So they're familiar with this trek. And since this is Jesus we're talking about, right, presumably, that he was always doing the right thing because, you know, he was sinless. Perhaps his parents assumed that he was already old enough and smart enough to keep up, right? He was verse 12. After all, that's why verse 44 tells us that they expected him to be amongst the group and his relatives that made the same journey. And Mary and Joseph thought that Jesus was among them. So although it's understandable for them to relax a bit and become a little complacent, I can't let them off the hook. Because out of all of the humans that's ever walked on this earth, Mary and Joseph should have known best how truly precious Jesus really is. Right? Just think about the miraculous circumstances of his birth that we learned so far in Luke's gospel. How Mary herself experienced an incredible miracle. The child was born of a virgin. And she even saw an angel's of heaven rejoicing and because of this child the fulfillment of uh, God's people has been fulfilled as foretold by the scriptures and because Mary and Joseph were portrayed as particularly observant Jews right they did everything that a Jewish person was meant to do they would have been quite familiar with the teachings of the promises of God so the point is they knew better than anyone theoretically and experientially that Jesus was the most important person ever. So one would assume that all this would have motivated them to do whatever it takes to ensure that Jesus was safe and accounted for. Because Jesus wasn't some rebellious delinquent, right? It wasn't like he was trying to run away and sneak out. Nor was he particularly resistant about leaving. Verse 51 tells us that Jesus complied and was submissive when his parents told him that it was time to go home. So it really does feel like a case of parental negligence whereby they were the ones who left before being sure where the son was. Because somehow in the middle of their busyness and routines of everyday life, they lost sight of how truly special Jesus was and unknowingly took lightly the great responsibility God had given them to raise the Messiah. Thus, they ultimately, though accidentally, wandered off without him. Now, I'm saying this not because we have to be stressed about where Jesus is all the time, right? As if, if we take our eyes off him for a second, suddenly, he's gone. But I think what happened to Jesus' parents is an image of how even if we have the most intense religious experience, even if we've witnessed the greatest miracles and done religious rituals with the utmost diligence and are taught by the most profound doctrines, amazing as those things may be, none of them actually guarantees that we won't lose sight of Jesus. None of these things can guarantee that we will be appreciating him and fulfilling our responsibilities to him in a way that is worthy of who he is. Because the only way we can do this is actually by being able to see Jesus from where we're standing at any given moment by having a living relationship with him. Now, The Gospel of Luke is going to talk a lot more about what happens when someone encounters the Messiah. And we're going to talk about one particular example in our text later. But for now, let us think about today and let us search our hearts, right? How often is it really that you are aware actively that Jesus is with you? 
theologically, I hope, that most of us Christians would agree that, well, he is actually always with us in the heavenlies, making intercession for us, and so on, right? And this is true. But how much of this truth is actually an identity-shaping reality for us? To what extent is this something that deeply influences our feelings and decisions as opposed to simply background information? And I know that for me personally, the answer is it's not enough. Way too much of my life is spent being functionally atheist. When I want to do what I want and what I need always takes priority and often God isn't even part of the consideration. Living as if he wasn't there. Living as if he didn't matter. Although theoretically, I'm saying to myself that he does. And I would dare even say, friends, that this happens in every battle that we've lost the sin. So whenever we stray and disobey God's law, at heart, it's because that we have lost sight of Jesus and lost our minds to our own sinful, selfish desires. Because, friends, there is no substitute to being actively conscious to the presence of Christ in our lives. After all, we are supposed to be following him and not the other way around, right? So no matter what religious experiences we had, no matter how diligently religious we are, our hearts are always prone to wander. Always prone to leaving the God we love. And so, not being able to see Jesus right now is a cause for concern. So the application is, let us discipline ourselves to anchor our hearts in Christ. And the main way we can do that is actually what point two is about, seeing him in God's word. So spiritual growth, point two, goes forward as we study the word. So personally for me, it's kind of hard in general to really imagine what Jesus was like as a baby, right? Or what he was like growing up as a child. He is, after all, right, the only begotten Son of God, Savior of the world and all that. And theologically, right, Christians affirm that he wasn't born with a sinful human nature like the rest of us was. So I imagine him to be like what's sung in that carol, Away in the Manger. Have you heard of it? Where one of the verses says, the cattle's are lowing, but the poor baby wakes, but the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes as if Jesus was some kind of magical baby who was born like emotionally regulated and he never even cried when woken up by some animals, right? But I think the Bible encourages us to consider that Jesus' humanity is more similar to us than that because Jesus did indeed have the full human experience. He needed to eat and drink and sleep just like we all do. And he felt fear and anxiety and genuinely experienced suffering just like everyone else. The cross is case in point to that. But today's text, I think, brings into view something about Jesus' humanity that I haven't considered much before. That he too had to develop and grow into maturity like any other humans uh, must do. Though, of course, in this perfect and sinless way. But nonetheless, right, the text shows us there is indeed a process. And a major part of this process is seen in verse 46, which shows what? That he was sitting among the teachers in this temple, right? These guys were the top tier of Bible experts in that day, right? The best of the best. And Jesus was there listening to them and asking them questions. Now, I don't think that Jesus was there trying to grill them about theology or trying to show off his theological acumen. Rather, it seems like that this was genuinely a learning experience for Jesus. Of course, Jesus did, because of who he is, have some profoundly and exceptionally profound insights, right? Verse 47 acknowledges that. Yet, simply flexing these to the the teachers doesn't seem like the point 
of him being there. Because, he says himself in a couple of verses later, that he was there because he needed to be in my father's house. We'll talk about what that means later, but for now, I invite us to just pause and reflect, right, a bit on how the only begotten Son of God, God's true Son, the Word of God, creator of heaven and earth, incarnate himself, he still needed to sit under the teaching of God's word. Think about that. Jesus still needed to sit under the teaching of God's word. It surpasses understanding, doesn't it? But to me, I think this is clearly what's shown in the text. And if this is true, friends, if indeed the Messiah himself had to be instructed in the word of God, what does that tell us about our own spiritual growth? What shot do we have at growing spiritually if we ourselves neglect the studying of God's word? Look, friends, right, finding a community at church is great. Singing songs together is nice. And doing ministry is and can be very fulfilling. But these are never supposed to be the end of themselves. Everything that we do here at church is meant to facilitate our growth by giving us the opportunity to sit under the teaching of God's word and apply it. To be wrestling with it together. That we may be immersed in it and more deeply shaped by it. That it may resonate in our hearts such that God's wisdom and love can fill us richly. That's what's actually going to get our spiritual growth going. But at least for those of us here who have been part of the church for a while, I hope that this isn't news to you, right? That understanding the Bible is key to spiritual growth. But why is it so hard for us? I gotta admit it, it kind of can be hard for me too when I get paid to do it. But Oftentimes, right, I find myself lacking the enthusiasm and commitment necessary to really drink deeply from the fountain of God's wisdom. Often it is because of the attitude that I have when I'm studying it. Oftentimes, my attitude is like, is the same as my attitude as when I was studying math in high school. Not really interested and just doing it so I don't fail the class. Now, I think why this is actually gets at the heart of the key difference between Jesus' humanity and ours, which is the fact that Jesus was given a pure nature who was able to fully love and trust in his heavenly Father. He was the only one Whoever only did the will of the Father and only said what the Father tells him. And if you read the gospel, friends, it didn't seem like Jesus had this alternative supernatural for, uh, source of information that none of us had access to. But what's different about him is that Jesus actually had this disposition of the heart that was untouched by sin. That allowed him to pursue the will of the Father and understand it fully and made him able to obey him perfectly in all things. And of course, in contrast to that, is our own disposition to trust God. That's our hearts. We only want to do the will of the Father if it is profitable or convenient for us. We only want to hear the Father's word if it agrees with us and affirms what we think. And if this is not the case, we are quite willing and happy to find alternative ways of life and, and words to listen to and live by. Because you see, that's what sin does to us. It turns us inwards and makes us love and trust ourselves above all. So let me ask you guys, let us ask ourselves, whose voice has been competing with God for your attention recently? And perhaps more importantly, why is it that for us, 
these voices seem like more attractive alternatives to God? Like what are they offering that somehow I don't believe God is? It's food for thought, friends. Because sitting under the teaching of God's word will always feel like a chore. Unless we're familiar enough with God's promises to be able to genuinely answer nothing to the questions that I asked before. That there is indeed and nothing I need that God doesn't offer in abundance. And of course, we can only get there to that posture if we have the kind of relationship that actually gives us the perspective that the promises of God and His commands are supremely meaningful and trustworthy. The kind of relationship with God that Jesus had, primarily as Father, right? Which is point three, spiritual growth relativizes our relationships. Now, I can imagine, I can only imagine, the emotional state of Mary as a mother who has lost her child for three whole days and this child also happened to be the Messiah, right? She must be freaking out. And when she found him, there must surely have been a ton of relief. But understandably, she also gave Jesus an earful there in verse 48. She says, your father and I have been looking for you in great distress. Your father and I, right? Now, Jesus' response there in verse 49 is one of those instances where we have to realize that only Jesus gets to do this. Because Jesus actually talks back to his mother, which again, very bad idea for any of us when our mother is scolding us. And Jesus said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now, this is a very interesting and certainly unexpected response from a 12-year-old Jesus to his parents, especially in that context, right? Because in the Jewish tradition, age 13 for boys is the age that's uh, called the age of accountability, whereby by that age, a boy is considered a man and is given all of the religious and occupational responsibilities of his man, right? At that point, he's responsible for himself. And he will be held accountable as a man. And you guys might even have heard of the celebration of this tradition from movies, right? It's called the Bar Mitzvah. So age 12 then, the year before that, would be the age where Jesus should be following and observing his father most closely is the age where he was supposed to be mentored unto adulthood before he can officially begin adulting. So Luke must have included this detail about how old Jesus was intentionally, right? He could have just said when Jesus was a child. Especially in light of his response. He says, do you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now something in the Greek that I want to point out here that the word for house, there is a word for house, isn't actually there. Literally in the Greek, it says that I must be in the things of my father. And some translations smooth it out to be that he must be about my father's business. So Mary was telling Jesus off, telling what's wrong with you? Don't you know that you're supposed to be with your dad right now? And Jesus was effectively telling Mary, but mom, I am. So did you notice there what Jesus was able to do? Jesus was able to primarily define himself before anything else as God's son. Such that he became willing to compromise even the relationship he had with his earthly parents. You see, Jesus was able to discern that the relationship he had with his heavenly father takes precedence over the relationship that he has with his earthly parents. Such that although Jesus never really rebelled against the expectations of his earthly parents, remember in verse 41, it notes specifically that Jesus was submissive to them, 
Jesus was able to relativize their relationship and he got his priority straight. You see, his relationship with God came first. And friends, the more we study in the life and teachings of Jesus that we're going to do and as we study the gospel according to Luke, especially as Jesus got closer to the cross, the more clear it's going to get that this relationship with God as Father is what carried him through his ministry. Through every suffering, every rejection, every betrayal, Jesus never wavered from distrust and commitment to God. And he was able to obey all the way to the cross. He did not let the expectations of his disciples, the pressure from his culture, the direct and violent oppression of his government to deter him. Jesus obeyed his father fully, even unto death. And our heavenly father, who is righteous and just, he did not leave his faithful son in the grave, but because of his obedience, God raised him from the grave and bestowed upon him the name above every name, such that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Philippians 2 says, at least. So brothers and sisters, although this relationship with God as Father is not natural to us as it was for Jesus, it is for Jesus, the gospel actually tells us that those who follow Jesus are included in this identity as children of God. We are all called, invited to call God Abba, Father. And the Apostle Paul actually hashes out how this works out in a couple of places, most notably perhaps in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. So I hope that that's up there uh, on the screen. And let me read that for you because it's so clear and so good. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are son, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then heir through God. You see what it's saying? It's saying that those of us who are followers of Jesus, who've been given God's indwelling presence in us, the Holy Spirit, that we have moved on, we've left behind our own sin-stained self, and we have been given this new, unique position of Jesus. Such that now we all can relate to God in the most intimate way possible as beloved sons and not slaves. So when Jesus will later say in chapter 8 that his brothers and sisters are who? Those who do the will of the Father. Jesus is not saying that this obedience is a condition that we must fulfill in order to be considered children. But it is actually a statement that we are no longer oppressed by the law, oppressed by our sin, that we have to obey God or forced to obey God because of some slavish fear. Rather, that those who God saves are now made like Jesus, who are able to do God's will joyfully and willingly. Being sure, having full confidence that what happened to Jesus, being brought from suffering unto glory, will happen to us. Because we trust that that's how our Heavenly Father treats us. So friends, for those of us who are going through something, who are feeling lonely and alone, struggling by ourselves, I pray that you remember the relationship that God offers you in Christ. That he is with you 
as a loyal, loving father. So we can go on to him. So let us not place our confidence on things like our doctrine, our rituals, or our religious experiences. Let us fix our eyes on God's true son and have him as the image of what spiritual growth and maturity will look like. That it is a journey of ever-increasing trust in our heavenly Father. And in this process, we will be transformed indeed from one degree of glory to another. So for those of us here who are following Jesus, my encouragement to you guys is that we may approach every spiritual discipline, every opportunity that we have to sit under God's word with the posture of deep, deep gratefulness and not obligation. Knowing that this is quality time with Daddy God, with God the Father. <laughs> and this is the way by means that the Father is actually shaping us and maturing us unto Christ. But if you are here and you still feel more like a slave than a son, if God's commands to you, if whatever religious obligations, Christianity, uh, you think places upon you feels more like a repressive requirement. I pray that you would remember Paul's words in Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7. How Jesus has indeed fulfilled every requirement that is required of sons in our place. So that our shortcomings are now no longer barriers, no longer impediment from being sons. But actually there is right now nothing stopping us from adopting this new identity as God's sons. If only you would commit to follow Jesus in his commitment to the will of the Father. The Father's arms are wide open. And if you would run to it on that day when you see him in glory, what you will find is not a judge, is not a tyrant, but the Father who is longing who is waiting to finally embrace his son or daughter and be with them forever in glory. Do you believe that? Do you want that? I pray that that could be our vision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we acknowledge to you that we have often forgotten this privilege that we have to call you as Father. Lord, we take it for granted. We don't always realize that we are unworthy of this. But you, Lord, are so gracious and merciful. You are so slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love that you continue to give us a chance to run back to you. Lord, I pray that you remind us of the mercies that you renew for us every morning and that you can give us by your Holy Spirit this perspective that enables us to rejoice at the opportunities that we have to come and know you. Shape us, Lord, and mold us into being like Christ who feels at home first and foremost in his Father's house where we will be when we see you again forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
even see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the storm is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues to So spirit come, put strength on every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful, of saints of old, still light the way, retelling triumphs of His grace, we hear the call. Friends, uh, texts like this that remind us about the humanity of Christ always baffles me, and it just um, reminds me of what all was put into my salvation. Jesus didn't just come and appear and die on a cross. He had to start where we start. He had to live a perfect life with limitations that we had, um, and he even had to grow in favor with God and man. He had to obey God so that God's favor can come upon him, but why? Not for himself. He was already fully favored by God. He started this process for us so that he could die on a cross and give us all of that precious favor he earned by his hard work for our sake. And with this, friends, I invite us to go uh, back uh, to our weeks and represent this Jesus who lived the perfect life we should have lived and gave us that perfection by dying the death that we deserve. This is the gospel. This is what makes Christianity unique. And I pray that today you're blessed and empowered by the risen son who truly loved you and lived his life and died for your sake. Receive now, friends, your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go, friends, in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.